Yeah, I think uh, the reason I thought about talking about simplicity was that I'm really struggling with trying to keep Scala tests simple as I go from 2.0, what, what exists, to 3.0. But hearing him introduce me, I realize that my life is also a little too complicated, and maybe that's really the real reason. Uh, but uh, that's actually kind of related. What uh, I, I would like to uh, ask is that you hold your questions to the end. If you feel like groaning in discontent, please hold that to the end also. But if you, you know those sounds that people make when they see fireworks? That's OK. You can do that as we go, <laughs> if you want. So my basic idea is that simplicity is about people. That's sort of the basic idea of the talk. Uh, so <laughs> I think I'm going to have to prove this. Um, and what this talk is really about is simplifying people's lives through software design. And I really mean, uh, uh, I mean, obviously, it's your users that are being simplified. Someone like that. That's that's actually uh, yes. What you you obviously would be affecting your user's life, but I think you're also affecting your own life and those of your coworkers because you actually use your own software when you work on it. Um, so <clears throat> so let's simplify something. This uh, this is a rhetorical question. See if you can figure out how if you could simplify this expression somehow. I'll give you a few seconds. Um, so it's just a, a Boolean expression of some type. I didn't say what type. But uh, if A is less than B, then it's already true, right? Oh, thank you. That's creative. All right. If A is less than B, then it's already true. If it, A is not less than B, then it's going to be false, right? And you're going to go see the other side. You're going to evaluate the other side. And A greater than or equal to B is actually the complement of A less than B, right? So if A less than B is false, then you know that's true. Uh, so it really doesn't matter. The whole right-hand side is going to be determined by C equals D, right? So I could simplify it that way. And I think that's simpler. And I think the reason it's simpler is because it has fewer pieces. Basically, it's simpler from the perspective of human beings can actually only keep track of so many things. I mean, there's actually a maximum to how many things we can keep in our head. I can actually keep, I can figure out the first one. But it's actually more fun or more pleasant or something to, to work with the second one. I don't have to think as hard. I don't have to work as hard. So it's really about people. right? The reason that's simpler is because it's simpler for people. And what we're doing is substituting. So this, uh, you know, one of the things I said is this first line here, that A less than B is equivalent to, essentially, this three, three equals sort of equal sign with three lines is, is equivalent to the inverse of the other one, A greater than or equal to B. And somehow we reasoned out and sort of proved to ourselves that any time you have an expression this, of this form, p or not p and q, like that, it's equivalent to just p or q. Because the, the not p part and doesn't matter. You can just get rid of that. It's going to be the same thing. Um, so that's substitution. And that is um, one way we can actually make things simpler is substitute a simpler thing for a more complex thing. Now, that sounds a little bit like functional programming to me, which is what uh, Scala is kind of a movement. It's like a, it's a reform movement that's trying to bring functional programming into the mainstream. And there's this guy, uh, Rich Hickey, who he actually invented Clojure, which is another functional language on the JVM, but it's, it's not. Uh, it's dynamically typed, so he thinks static typing is complexity that's not, not worth it, essentially. Um, what he, he gave a talk called uh, Simple Made Easy a couple years ago, which is really good. And what he talked about is that the main thing about complexity, and he looked at the word roots, was interleaving of things. So things are, that complexity, the word origin means that things are interleaved or intertwined. And that what you want to do is, is just have one thing that isn't intertwined with other things. And so he said what matters for simplicity is that there's no interleaving, but not that there's just one thing. So what, if you ha are designing some piece of software and it's trying to do too many things, too many different concepts are interleaved together, what you would do is bust it up into multiple pieces, each of which is focused on one thing. right? But now you have more pieces. So what he's saying here is that simplicity is not about counting things. It's OK if I have three things instead of one, as long as each one is focused on one thing. Right. 
Um, but that kind of, I think, conflicts with what, I, what we saw earlier with that simplified expression. The reason that this expression, uh, the lower one is simpler, is it has fewer parts, I think. Um, so let's count them. Uh, let's do what he said we shouldn't do. Uh, the top one, I see three clauses and two operators. Right? The second one, I see two clauses and one operator. And I think it is actually about counting things in that sense. Um, what you could try to do is, can we simplify this any further? Can you think of a way to simplify that expression, like the bottom expression? I see someone shaking their head no. So you could try to do this, right? <laughs> um, that's got fewer pieces if you're just counting things. But the problem is it doesn't actually mean the same thing. So I think part of what the process of software design is, is simplifying things down to a, the simplest ex way we can come up with they're trying to find the simplest way to express something and still actually provide that service you're trying to provide. Like the feature you're trying to implement, whatever you're trying to give people through it. Um, here, this bottom one doesn't work because it actually doesn't provide the same you know, true-false behavior. So, okay. So there's another guy, uh, Runar. Uh, have anybody, does anybody know this guy? This is the, uh, one of the co-authors of the, you don't. This is one of the co-authors of the Red Book, uh, Functional Programming in Scala. Have you have seen that one before? All right, so um, I was, uh, he was at, and I was at John Pretty's conference last week, and, and uh, Runar was there giving a keynote. And he's been given a few, he's been invited to give keynotes ever since he published that book. And uh, I think he does a really good job at it. I think I, I, was, uh, tell, I was sitting with his wife and telling him I think he's becoming a thought leader, and that someday, uh, he's going to have his picture up on a slide with a quote, which I thought, hey, I can do that. So that's why I put him up here. <laughs> um, so he's really trying to sell functional programming. He's, a, he's called himself a functional extremist. Um, and he, he also talks a lot about free monads. And I think, you know, people often give away things for free until people get addicted. So you should beware. But, um, <laughs> This talk was in England at Scala Exchange, and he was just trying to introduce people to this concept. And he talked about uh, what he means by functional programming is a referentially transparent program built out of other referentially transparent parts. So, and what referentially transparent means is that I can unplug this thing and substitute in its result. Um, and, and so it's, it's programming with functions where they're pure, where the, what you do is you pass some, uh, referentially transparent arguments into a function. It just evaluates those. It doesn't grab things from anywhere else. It doesn't uh, do any side effect. And it just evaluates it, re returns a result. That's something that's referentially transparent because I can just replace that, that whole expression with the result and it means the same thing. Um, so what he said is modular software is more comprehensible because you can look at the individual components in isolation. And he's talking about that functional, like referentially transparent code is modular because I can unplug this piece and stick it over there without worrying about wires dangling. Like I've got this wire here. I was kind of trying to hide it. I was afraid I was going to get caught up in it. When you have side effects, they're like entangling some extra behavior with computing the result and returning it. Right? So it's like, if you really try and, and say, okay, I'm going to try and get rid of all the entanglements, I think what you're going to end up with is pure functions. So I think that's a lot about what actually Scala is about and what this movement towards functional programming is about is it's a way that we can better re, you know, understand our software because it's simpler for us to deal with, right? Okay. So um, what I wanted to demo, sort of like give you a thought experience, is what, what if we actually did this? Uh, what if we stuck a side effect in the greater than, equal than method? Now, I had to make it big in because I didn't know what it would look like on int. Uh, so let's assume this, the type of those a, b, c, and d are big int. Um, now, actually, a less than b is not necessarily the inverse of a greater than, equal to b because I don't get that print line, right? So that's the entanglement of, of a side effect. Like, I, it means I can't do this substitution anymore. I can't simplify it. I have to keep that in my head. Um, but on the other hand, I, I kind of wanted to, to give a counterpoint. Uh, functional extremists will say, well, you can kind of, I get the vibe anyway, that you can reason about functional code, you can't reason about imperative code. And I actually do write that kind of print line statement often. I usually write tests. Um, 
and usually my code will do what I think it does as I go. But sometimes it's like, what? It, you know, I wrote the test, the test is failing, and I can't figure out why. I will stick a message in, I won't say hello Toronto, I'll say got here with exclamation points so I can find it. And then I execute it and then I look and I'm like, ah, that's what's going on. It's not being called or it's being called with different things. And so that actually helps, you know, that kind of side effect helps me reason about code for a while, then I remove them, right? And I want to give you a, a, another example, um, which is kind of a puzzler. Um, this is a little bit of code and I have to warn you, it has side effects. So it might be a little bit uh, confusing. Um, but I want you to just look at that code and see if you can figure out what it's going to do. And I'll give you four choices in Puzzler's fashion. Number one, it prints, hello, Toronto. Number two, throws null pointer exception. Number three, prints list 012. Or number four, plays Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> this is kind of a softball one. Uh, but just, I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, it was a trick question. It plays Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, actually. <laughs> Um, no, it, it does what you think it does. It just prints list 012. And I think uh, what I wanted to demo here is that this has got a var, it's got a mutable data structure, it's got a while loop, it's got mutation of the mutable data structure, it got reassignment of the var, everything imperative, but I can still reason about it because it's simple enough. In other words, I, it's in isolation. I can understand that code. So I can reason about imperative code just as easily as functional code. Um, what is different between imperative and functional is it, how it scales up. So there's just a few pieces here. There's enough for my brain to follow, but we're, what uh, Runar even talks about in his talk in a, in a sort of small print is that local effects are okay. So inside a method, it's okay to do something like this if it's fast for performance or if it's easier for you to write and understand. Uh, but then at the bottom, what you would do is say buff.toList and return that. And now that method is still, can still be referentially transparent. Um, and and the, the point is that as things grow larger, it comes very, very difficult very quickly for us to keep track of side effects as things get bigger. Um, so that's where functional programming, doing things referentially transparent, that scales much better because you can always substitute something uh, smaller, the actual result, with something bigger. Uh, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. You can substitute something big with something small. Okay. All right, so um, just a quick review. This is really nothing new. Uh, when I was a young whippersnapper just starting out in programming, I was taught, uh, I, I was programming in C, and, and there was something called structured design that I was taught at the company I was working at. And they just said minimize coupling, maximize cohesion. That was sort of two simple rules that you're supposed to do. And I think that's really all I'm talking about and that's all Rich Hickey was talking about in his talk, is these two things. So Rich talks about if you've got something with doing too many things, you bust it up into multiple parts, each focused on one thing. That's what cohesion meant. And you want to maximize the cohesion of the pieces. So any, anywhere I look in your code, the thing I'm looking at, it's really responsible for one thing, or it's sort of about one concept. That was maximize cohesion. And then minimize coupling was, well, now let's say I've busted it up and I've got 10 pieces. For my program to work, these guys have to work together somehow. So you need to have actual wires going between them. You do have to have some interleavings of them. And the, the advice was, way back then, was to minimize that interface. And OO was kind of about that, right? We, we have a class with them, you know, we separate interface and implementation. We can actually have a cohesive class with a minimal interface. And so I think, um, I do Scala tests. I've been working on Scala tests for eight or nine years. I don't lost track now, but that's kind of how I, I mean, I absorbed that as a youngster and I, I sort of tried to do that in Scala tests. It's got a lot of pieces in it, but I tried to make each one focus on just one thing and have a minimal interface. Um, so for example, style traits, there's lifecycle methods like run test and with fixture and run. Those, there's like eight of those. Um, the mix in traits, the, they only talk, they only override the behavior or modify the behavior of the style traits through those points of coupling, right? So I tried to minimize it. So I think that actually worked in Scala test. Um, Rich Hickey said, you know, it's not about counting things and I do worry about counting things because they're so large, um, but that's, that's sort of an example of that kind of advice, or like a, I follow that advice, and, and we ended up with the way the Scala test is designed. Um, 
But there's this other guy who has a counterpoint. This is uh, Ken Arnold. Uh, he uh, was at Sun, and he designed Java Spaces, um, among other things. He's also on the, uh, there's a book about Java programming by James Gossing and Ken Arnold. That was, that was uh, this guy. And uh, he was involved, I was involved in the Genie community. He was in, you know, on the Genie team. And he one time talked about this concept of surface area of a design, which was what you need to understand about a design to figure out what you care about. So if you look at Scala test, I, I worry about surface area that it's getting too big or that it's already gotten too big. It's so big that you, you get lost in it, you can't find the things you want. Now if you are able to find what you want, then, then when you mix those things together, you have a very simple, very focused, very cohesive, easy to understand little test framework for your project. But there's this counting things thing I do, which I worry about, which is how big it is getting. And that's really, I think, the core problem with going from 2.0 to 3.0. It is a old project now, and we had this massive earthquake of a new uh, requirement, which was ScalaJS. And ScalaJS took us five months to support, five months full time of work to support, because it was so different than the, J the JVM, and we just didn't see it coming. Um, and it really threatens to explode this surface area and, and complexity, and that's what I've really been struggling with the last, the last uh, six months, I'd say. Um, so I wanted to show you a little bit about history, uh, where Scala test came from. This is, uh, this, this is a Java test framework that I wrote in 2001. Uh, because I was trying to not use JUnit, but generate JUnit or integrate with JUnit in some way um, related to Genie. And I just couldn't figure it out. I thought it was so muddled and, and disorganized that I, I, I at one point threw my hands up and said, it would be easier to write my own test framework than to figure out JUnit. Well, that turned out to be not true because it took me two months to write this thing. But at the end, it pretty much did everything JUnit did. But JUnit at that time had about 33 classes and interfaces in its in Java doc. That's what it, in, in the API is pretty small, but mine had six and it did the same stuff. So it's kind of, I felt like it's simpler, right? It's kind of like simplifying that expression. It does the same thing, but has fewer parts. Um, but you can kind of see some of the stuff that showed up in like, that's where test failed exception came from. Suite was already this idea of, it had to be a class, not a trait, but it had lifecycle methods that you can override. Um, there's runner, that's also in Scala test, and reporter. The other two things didn't, got changed, but. So I'm gonna show you what Scala test looks like. <laughs> this, is, this is the entire list of classes and interfaces in Suite Runner, um, which I never actually released 1.0 because I decided JUnit had already won. Uh, so what I did early on when I was working on the book, the, the programming in Scala book, was I ported uh, this to Scala, and that became Scala test. That was sort of like the first, that's where it came from. Um, so now, this is, now what you can see here is, see the scroll bar, it's kind of going down. It's only gone down that far so far. Uh, so there's, there's, there's four more, so it's getting farther. Still not quite down at the bottom and there's two more. So there's 10 of these. And this is in the feature assertion result type branch. I mean, this is in working on 3.0. It's just, it's just exploding too big. Um, so another way that Simplicity is about counting things is surface area, I think. So that's um, what <clears throat> I'm struggling with. And so one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about was I wanted to show you some of the features that we were thinking about putting in and how I'm, like what the design trade-offs are of, of how it's pushing towards complexity and how I'm trying to rein it in. So I was uh, uh, teaching play maybe a year and a half ago, and I was repeating that mantra. Basically, when you sort of teach type safe courses, you have to say, never block. Now, yesterday you saw never ever block, right? So I was thinking, you know, you should really be never ever say never, <laughs> except in expressions involving saying never, because then you can say never, right? But um, that's kind of too complicated, but I, I was, we actually didn't say never ever block. What we said was never ever block, except in tests it's okay to block. That's what we kept telling people because people would block in their tests all the time. And then I'm, I was sitting thinking, well, why are we saying that? Why do you have to block in your tests? And I couldn't think of a good reason. And, and so what play does is if you want to, if you need to do something that's gonna take a while, 
Uh, to be reactive, what you do is you don't block and wait for that to finish and then return a response to the framework. What you do is you put the code that's going to compute that result in a future and return immediately the future to the framework, and the framework will sort of babysit that future, and then when it completes, it'll say, okay, now I got the response, I'll send it back to the client. So it takes care of that for you. So I thought, well, why couldn't you do something like this in a test where you, uh, if you call an async call, instead of blocking and waiting for the answer and then asserting on it, you can map an assertion onto that future. Right? So what this, my async call does is it calls some web service or something, and then it's, it is in a different thread, but it's, it's going to take a while. right? So instead of blocking on that, I say, I, I get a future back that's, that's doing that. I map that future, and, the, and when the future completes, this will be uh, run. It'll take the value that came back, which let's say it's an int, and then it asserts i greater than 0. And then you just re immediately return the future to the test framework, just kind of like you immediately return the future to play or to spray or awk HTTP. Um, so I thought about that, and I talked to some Akka, the Akka team, and they thought, well, yeah, that's kind of maybe a good idea. And uh, in, on a train to Crested Butte the last fall, I, I just I sort of figured out how we could do it. Um, right now, FlatSpec and, and FlatSpec-like are uh, basically a class and a trait. Originally, there was just FlatSpec, which was a trait. But it turned out it's faster to compile classes, and most people extend FlatSpec or, or FunSpec or whatever their style trait of choice is. So I made that a class, and I, I pulled out FlatSpec-like as, as a, the trait. And all the meat and potatoes, all the behavior, all the code for FlatSpec is up in FlatSpec-like. Right? And then, by the way, there was this thing called test registration that was extended by, by uh, traits that uh, actually register tests at, at, at construction time. So it's all the most of style traits that all the style traits were tests or functions, right? Extended that. So what I said, well, what I could do is I could add an abstract type to test registration, which is the registration type. And then I move up the meat and potatoes to this thing called flat spec registering. And that takes a type parameter, um, and it fixes the registration type to that type parameter. And then down here, I just this becomes a one-liner. Flat spec like is now a one-liner. Used to have all the meat and potatoes. Now it's just a one-liner. It say I extend. I'm a flat spec that registers unit. That was what was hard coded before, but now the now it's kind of abstract up here. And I I say that I'm registering unit, which allows me to make another set over here, where the registration type is future of something. Uh, so that's, that's what I did, and, I, and if you can see, like, surface area-wise, I've taken two, two, like, per style trait, two uh, things, flat spec like and flat spec, and I've made it five. And we have seven style traits, so that's three more, it's, it's 21 more things in the interface, and it's just, like, that bothers me, right? So I talked to people. Um, at Scala Day, uh, was it Scala Days? Yes, in Amsterdam again. Talked to lots of different people, and they kind of all say, "Yeah, I think this is seems like a nice idea." But um, nobody really was had a burning need for it, so I, I really didn't want. I just I just didn't put it in because even though it seems like a nice idea, I think the oh test. You know, I can't. I think about testing so much. Instead of the, I wrote test. <laughs> That's weird. So the, <laughs> the best way. To simplify, I didn't test this, obviously. The best way <laughs> to simplify software is to simplify the requirements if you can. Just, and, and I think this is really hard. And at, at uh, places where I worked, um, I've tried to ask him, do we, you know, what are the, there was one place I worked where I, I went to the marketing guy, and there, were, there was like a list of eight things we were supposed to release. And it's like a lot of stuff. And I said, well, what's really important? Could we just do the important ones in the next release and do the other ones later? He says, actually, there's just one that's really needed, just one. And I said, OK, well, let's focus on that first, and we'll do the others later. He said, sure, OK. And so then we had the meeting with the big boss, like the CEO guy. And I mentioned this. And the marketing guy says, no, 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 we need all of it. I was like, but yesterday, didn't you? No, 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 we need all of it. And I, he just, I don't know what happened, but we had to do all of them. And, uh, and, and then uh, just recently, that was many years back, that company actually went out of business, kind of because of that. Um, <laughs> they wrote a bad contract. They took on too much. They didn't do it in small pieces. Um, so just recently, I did a contract where uh, the project, I thought, might be a good fit for Spark. So I, I said that, and, and, and the client agreed. 
And then as we got into it, because there's the, it's like a kind of a pipeline, but I realized actually we should do one piece at a time and just save files. And so I thought, you know, we really probably don't need Spark. We could get rid of that. But he said, you know, we actually, part of this, the whole thing, reason we're doing this is to get experience with technologies like Spark. So let's go ahead and use it. And I, three times I went back and I said, you know, we really don't need Spark. It's adding a lot of complexity. It's slowing us down. And he said, well, actually, the, we should use Spark. So I couldn't get rid of it. Finally, at the end, he said, you know, maybe we should have got rid of Spark. <laughs> but um, we did learn a lot about Spark, and that was really one of their goals. Uh, but it's just, it's really hard to get rid of them. So this one, I, I just said, you know, async tests, I'm not going to put it. I don't have evidence that the extra complexity is going to be worth the cost. OK. So <clears throat> uh, after uh, uh, John's conference last weekend, uh, I was staying at the same, ho the same hotel with this person. Uh, this is Adrian Morris. He works on the Scala compiler. And uh, he said, you know, you want to go get a drink? So we went down and had some whiskey. And, and, and maybe that softened him up a little bit. He said something odd I mean, I thought that surprised me, which was people complain about that, complex, uh, that subtyping adds complexity. But sometimes complexity is what makes life interesting. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, I don't think that's going to satisfy the Scala Z folks. But what he said is <laughs> seasons add complexity, right? Because you got to. You got to decide, if, you know, what to wear. You have to all kinds of issues that you have to deal with with seasons. We both live in California where we don't have them, right? Mm -hmm. And we both came from places that did have them, so we actually miss some of that. He said, when you don't have seasons, you can wear flip flops all the time, but then you don't get nice fall colors, right? And and um, another example of this, I think, is is when you get a dog, if you're a dog person and you like dogs, that actually adds some complexity to your life because you got to feed them, you got to clean up after them. You've got to spend a lot of time with them. You've got to take them for walks. You've got to take them to the vet. That costs money. Um, but you get something back from them, a kind of companionship that's really deeply meaningful if you're a dog person. And you actually want the whole package. You want that complexity in your life. Um, so I think it's kind of like that expression, you know, we couldn't make it any simpler. If I really want that expression, that amount of complexity is what I want, right? So you have to figure out what people actually want. Do they really want async or not, is what I was really trying to figure out, async tests. And, and I, I wasn't sure they, they did, right? So I was going to leave it out. And we did this five-month job uh, of you know, getting Scala tests working on, uh, on, on Scala.js, right? So now you can write your tests once. They can, you can run them on Scala and run them uh, on the JVM or, or JavaScript, your Scala test tests. Um, and I was about to release RC1, 3.0 RC1, three months ago, <laughs> when this issue came in um, by some guy, I don't know who he is, Chandra Sekhar Code. His name is Code. Uh, <laughs> and what he did is something that we didn't really imagine when we were testing our stuff. Um, JavaScript VMs just have one thread. So they're kind of like the AWT event thread. They just go around, and there's just one thread in there. So you really don't have anything multi-threaded. Um, they have an event queue, just like ADBT or Swing, right? And so uh, when the, the JavaScript, you know, Scala.js folks ported futures, Scala futures, they have two execu execution contexts, one that sticks things on the event queue and one that just does it right now. And so our blocking, you know, we just ported our Scala futures trait. You can see it right there, Scala futures, which blocks. So this future value blocks until the future completes and then returns a result, and then you can do some some assertions on it, right? Um, and that worked in all our tests because JavaScript doesn't have threads, right? It can't really be async. But what, I, what we didn't, because we're like inexperienced in JavaScript, uh, realize is that from JavaScript you can call out of the JVM. And that's pretty obvious in hindsight. But basically what he does, this simple sample service.get data does, is it's going outside the, the, J, the, uh, the JavaScript VM and doing an, a really async call. And the JavaScript VM then moves on, uh, and which means it actually returns the future value already, which is wrong. And then sometime later, that, that C code does complete, the async call actually does complete, and something goes on the, you know, gets stuck on the JavaScript event queue. When, by that time, it's too late. Right? The test has already failed and doesn't work. And I was like, I knew how to fix it. And that was async tests. The only way to fix this is that from JavaScript, there has to be a way to return a future from a test. So, the, so then I, I, I couldn't release it yet because we didn't have 
we hadn't put that in yet. I was like not, I was holding off that until, until I had evidence that was needed. And so now it was needed. So what I, what I was now faced with was what is the, you know, what should the type of this test be? Should it be future of unit? And, in, and when we first mocked it up or actually implemented it, it was future of unit because the, the type of a regular test was unit. So this was future of unit, but really it needs to be future of any. Because when you have unit, it will discard a value. No matter what you put there, it'll stick a unit value there. But if you have future of unit, it doesn't do any value discarding. So really, what that is for is compatibility with uh, all kinds of uh, testing tools, um, like Makito, or EasyMock, or JMock, or Aka Test Kit. Those all return different kinds of things. They don't all return unit. Um, so you really need to be able to, like, it, it, to integrate with all those tools and make it easy to use, you kind of want to be able to have a test be anything at the end. And that's what it's been for eight years. And, and actually, no one's ever complained about that, that it's like type unit. Um, but it just seemed error prone to me. Now that it's like less obvious that you know, if you forget an assert, it happens rarely in regular tests. I think it might be more, ob more common in, in async tests. Um, and I just thought it was confusing. I wanted to be able to say you map it to a future assertion. So I wanted some type called assertion. But I didn't have one of those. So I actually uh, was faced with uh, this problem. So this guy is, is Jim Waldo. And he's kind of, he was uh, the lead of the Genie project. And I was, uh, I, I kind of, uh, I think, he, you know, of, of all the people that influenced my approach to design, uh, um, this is probably the person that was the most influential. Um, he's now the CTO of Harvard. And I went and I, I met with him, had a beer with him uh, last April in Boston. And I told him that, that, you know, I think he was like one of the main influences of my approach to design. And he said, I don't, I mean, I, that I learned simplicity from, from these guys, from the Genie team. And he said he thought that I actually was, didn't get it from them, that I was kind of there from my, my personality was that way. And that that's why I was attracted to those folks. Um, but what, what he, he told me a story that I wanted to repeat, which was, uh, he apprenticed with a guy named Jim Hamilton uh, at Apollo. That was a company he worked at. And he said, Jim's harshest criticism on a specification, which they did actually write in those days, was to flip it over his desk and say, that's too hard. I mean, he would look at what you'd come up with, and he just said, that's too hard. And what his point was, was that if you didn't have a simple solution, it was because you didn't really understand the problem well enough. So go back and try to understand the problem better, and, and then until you're, the uh, solution is simple basically. And that's kind of what I kept doing over and over and over the past few months. It's like trying to figure out how to fit all this stuff into Scala tests without exploding complexity and just doing this to myself, throwing, oh, this is just too hard. I can't go that direction. I can't break everybody's code. I can't add this many types into the API. And it's just this, been this very difficult uh, struggle. Um, so let me show you what I have come up with so far. I mean, it may change, but uh, this is something that came out in Scala Test 2.0, which is a outcome family. And this is the type of the test function passed into with fixture, and it's what with fixture returns. It returns an outcome of a test. It's either succeeded, fa succeeded failed, canceled, or pending. And what um, succeeded is and pending is uh, just a, a singleton object. So it's just like object succeeded. It just gets returned, right? Um, failed and canceled are classes that you have to instantiate and stick an exception in. Because when a, when a test fails, people want to see a stack trace. They want to see how they got there. And um, so it's just a way to like, look at the result of a test without actually catch, having to catch the exception. It's inside this failed already. Um, so what I did is I made a type assertion that's equal to succeeded.type. And what that means is, if you have something of type assertion, it has to be the succeeded singleton. So that's what assertion means, is the succeeded singleton object. The only thing uh, in the world that is type assertion is this succeeded singleton object. So then I just made assert and should and must return succeeded instead of this, the unit value. So what they did before was return the unit value, which is a singleton. So now they just return a different singleton if it succeeds. But if it fails, it still does the same thing. It throws the same exception as before. Okay, so that's the change I made. And so now, uh, what I, uh, so let's see, x is one, x equals one is true, so I get succeeded, x equals two is false, so I get test failed exception one did not equal two with the stack. 
trace, and x should be greater than zero succeeded, right? So we changed that in a experiment branch. Um, so currently, this is what I ended up with, which is I actually will change the type of test in Scalatis 3.0 from unit to assertion, uh, which actually would break a lot of code, which I'm going to fix in the third bullet point, right? Because, for example, if you used intercept, intercept make sure that it, an exception is uh, thrown that you expect, and it returns it so you can investigate it more. So the type of that is throwable. So if you have that at the end of your test, that would no longer compile, because that's a throwable is not an assertion, right? Um, which I just can't break code like that. And then the registration type of async styles is future assertion. So I can say it really is future assertion. You map your future int to a future assertion, give that back to Scala test, and that's, that's your test, right? Um, but then there's this, I, I created a trait called compatibility that has impl an implicit from any to assertion. And then in the async test, in addition, there's a few, uh, from future of t, because it's not covariant, I can't say future of any, I have to future of any type t to future of assertion. So that actually, uh, it'll be just like it was before. You can really end a test with anything. Um, and then there's another trait, safety, which if you want, you can turn off those two implicits, and now you're actually forced to make type assertion, um, which means you, you know, if you want to use test kit, which it's like expect message, that's for ACA, returns unit, at the end you'll have to say succeed, which is kind of annoying. So if you're using test kit, you might go for compatibility. If you're just using Scala test assertions, you might go for safety. Um, but I think that's, that's the best I could come up with. And then there's just two families. There's the regular ones, which work just like they did before, so all your old code works. And there's the new ones that uh, are async. Uh, so um, there was one other thing that I wanted to, sh to kind of demo. I wanted to demo something that was in the mix, which forced the design in a certain direction, which is called um, factor expectation. So one of the features that I wanted to add was a, a, just a simple syntax for laws testing because people have asked about how do I test that the equality methods I write, the equals and hash code, obey the contracts. And those contracts are expressed in terms of mathematical laws. Um, the other place this came from is I created this type called or in Scalactic, and it's supposed to be a monad, it's supposed to be a valid functor, but I didn't have a nice way in Scaltus to say this should pass the monad laws, this should pass the functor laws. And I just think, there's not been a large number of people ask me for that, but I sort of think, I think it's important. And so I just want to add a little bit uh, into Scala test to, to make that nice, right? Um, and, it, and it turns out that when you make laws, you, you want to compose them functionally so that, that you can build smaller ones out of, larger ones out of smaller ones. And exceptions really get in the way there. I think throwing exceptions from asserts works really well for tests because you usually want to fail fast and you want to stack trace anyway. Um, so, but for laws, like defining laws, it's kind of annoying. So what I did a few years ago is I had an expect, I deprecated this so that I could, I could re bring back expect to be a kind of assertion that doesn't throw an exception, it returns a result. So for every assert something, there's an expect something now in this branch. Uh, and the difference is that assert x equals one would return succeeded. This returns yes, one equaled one. And expect x greater than 10, instead of throwing test failed exception, that's what assert would do, it just returns no, one was not greater than 10. So what, what yes or no is, is a fact. A fact is either yes or no. It's kind of like Boolean is equal to or false. And it has the same uh, operators. So. One of the things that Rich Hickey talked about in his, his talk is um, that he thinks we focus too much on easy. And, and so he's like trying to market closure, or try to convince people to try closure, which is very different. It's very unfamiliar to most people used to C and C++ and Java kind of languages. Um, and, and people will say, well, it's not easy because it's, I'm not familiar with it, right? So he, what I wanted to, what I do, though, is I, I try to make things fit with something you already know, and that makes it easy. So I think easy is a good design technique, actually. Um, so fact is like Boolean with messages. 
So the same operators are there, and they work the same way, except you get, it tracks messages as you go. Um, there's also an implies and an is equivalent to, which is from propositional logic or predicate logic. So what, if you actually make a test out of a expectation expression, it's actually like a statement of, of logic, um, which I think is what the type of a test is. And then um, expect is like assert, except instead of uh, succeeded or throwing an exception, it returns yes or no. And then there's a will matcher that works like should or must, which is the same thing. Should or must will either return succeeded or throw an exception. Will will either return yes or return no. So I wanted to show you a quick demo of something. So uh, let's see. Let's make a val x equals 1. I can just say expect x equals 1. Let's make one that is true and expect x equals false, uh, equals 2. Um, one did not equal 2. And then I can and these together, res 0, res 0, and res 1. Whoops, that's not going to work. Res 1. Um, whoops, not and. It's Boolean, right? It's like Boolean. And um, so you can say or, and uh, you can say not. Let's, let's make one of them. I think or should be true, right? Yep. And note that it's short-circuited, so it's just like that. So there also is an operator, there's like single, do people know about this? I actually didn't know about this for a long time, or I'd forgotten it. Boolean has these, a single ampersand and a single pipe that doesn't short-circuit. So, so does fact, it also has it. Um, or I can say and and negate the one that was false. Which one was false? The second one, right? So it's basically like Boolean algebra. Um, and then you can also do the same thing with uh, will matchers. X will be greater than 2 is false, right? Um, so if I or that with or X will be uh, less than 10, which is true. That'll be true. Um, and when you convert one of these to an assertion, like if it's true, like res 8.2 assertion, this one is, is a, a yes. It just returns succeeded. Now, that, that's yes is, means succeeded. But if I go res 7, which was a, a no, then that's where you, you get an exception. So the other thing that I was worried about was if we have tests of, with a result type of unit and someone put an expectation in there, then it would just throw away the no and succeed, right? So by making tests the result type of assertion, even though I have those implicit conversions from any to unit, or any to uh, assertion, sorry, I can have another one from expectation to assertion that will, will dominate. So if it actually is an expectation, It'll, the no will become a failure, a test failure. And I thought that was, if, if I was going to bring this in, that was another thing I had to have not error prone. It needed to always work. So, okay. Oops, that was my demo. That was my demo. I just wanted to, you to know what I just did. And um, essentially, just uh, to summarize, I just uh, think that you should focus software design on, on people. And when you think about simplifying software, you, you really should focus on find a way to simplify people's lives. That's, that's uh, what software design is, is really about. So, All right, that is my talk. Um, there is another talk I did, by the way, that's called Simplicity and Scholar Design, which is very specific, like, things to do. You could look that up on, uh, on the internet. Um, if you want to see more specifics, this is more of like a high level. And we have a few minutes, I think, for, for questions.